since we've already had two people plug the Bible school, I, the third time's a charm, so I'm going to say so. <laughs> I just want to encourage you, if you have never really studied the, the Bible, like in a, in a you know, classroom setting, it's a lot different than how we teach in, uh, on, on, say, Tuesday night, for example. So my goal is that for First Corinthians, you'll learn uh, each chapter, what's in there, also handle a number of uh, uh, Bible difficulties uh, found in there. There's a, a quite, a, uh, quite a few. I'd say about six or so, seven maybe, that we'll handle. So the, the whole idea is to help, uh, help us to develop the, the uh, you know, tools uh, in the familiarity with the rules of interpretation. Primarily is, is taking um, verses and leaving them in context and studying things in context. So and then, of course, the application of your word, as Brother Ararats reminds us all the time. <laughs> so we're learning the word of God accurately, and then you'll have an accurate application. Uh, I always like to think about uh, teaching observation. I think that's a, a skill that's, that's often not, it's taught. I mean, as far as your know, Bible uh, study, you know, they say observation, then, a, then interpretation, then application. However, what we often do is uh, kind of forget to do your own personal observation. And um, especially pastors that are, have not a whole lot of time when they prepare a message, they'll often go immediately to a commentary and pull it down. And like a good friend of mine, he goes, that's the first thing I do, <laughs> go to the commentary. I said, well, why don't you, you try reading it yourself first and then see what, what uh, but you learn on your own and then compare it to a commentary. Not, not, not debunking commentaries, but I'm trying to uplift the work of the Holy Spirit in your life individually as he illuminates the word of God. So anyway, if you come, that'd be great. If you can't make it, another time. It's, uh, it's been said, you know, and in Los Angeles, there's, I think it's really about the only Bible school in Los Angeles. There, there might be a, another one, but you, you never hear of any other, which is really a shame. I mean, we're one of the biggest cities in the world, and there's hardly a Bible school. And so this is, uh, is I've heard others say it's a, the best kept secret in Los Angeles. So I actually started teaching there back in 1983, I think it was, 83, 84, and 5. And then we went overseas as missionaries, but uh, they have some old, uh, old uh, directories or you know, uh, from that time period. And uh, I, I forgot about it. I, Dr. Felix was also teaching at the same time because I went in there and I, and I showed him a, a card. I said, "Look at this card that uh, this, you know the staff and the the uh, s some students signed." And we we're going away when we were going away overseas, and he goes, "Yeah, he goes, I signed that too." <laughs> Oh, yeah, there it was. So anyway, the great tradition is, is started, I think, in the early 60s by um, J. Vern McGee, I think, was the instigator of it and kind of got it going. And, and, uh, and it's been going for quite a few years now. I've always wanted, you know, since coming here to Venice, to have a Venice campus. So I had to ask Dr. Felix a number of times, said, uh, would be nice. Maybe we could have a Venice campus. No, 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 no. And then, uh, right before COVID started, he finally said, "Okay." <laughs> so, so that's how that has developed. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, we're students of your word. And Lord, as uh, we just sung a beautiful song about uh, asking the Holy Spirit to come, and we we know, Lord, the Holy Spirit, if we are true believers, are inside us al already, and so. In one sense, we would just pray that we get out of the way of the Holy Spirit as now he speaks through your word and in our hearts to change us, to make us even more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, without a doubt, one of my greatest heroes, and probably yours as well, the Bible is King David. Uh, what a man. What a godly king and a, a good man. And uh, I just love it because when you read throughout the the, the uh this time period in Samuel and then into the books of the kings and then subsequent kings, they always would say there's no one like David whose heart was what? You know, fully devoted to the Lord. Or sometimes they give a compliment to the king. He, he walked in the ways like David did with a you know, 
heart devoted to the Lord. And uh, what, a, what a man. And even later on, even after his big, big mess up, it said, uh, complimenting the Lord, complimenting David, you know, one who followed after me with his whole heart. And, you know, just accept. <laughs> There's an exception clause there, unfortunately. Uh, we are going to look at that tonight and you know, also look at uh, this morning as well with uh, a couple psalms that speak to that time period of David's life. But even before David was anointed king, uh, the first king was named Saul. Saul. And, uh, you know, he was a humble guy, at least at first, and seemed to obey the Lord at first, but it didn't take long for him, at least chapter-wise, for him to not obey the Lord. And when the, the uh, Israelites are going to fight the Philistines, and the Philistines had a great army, and they were gathering around, and Saul had arranged for Samuel to come and offer sacrifices, uh, at an appointed time, I believe it was seven days, wasn't it? Like that? So the seventh day came, and the Philistines were gathered, getting larger, and the Israeli army was what? Kind of thinning out. Thinning out. And so Saul got anxious, and he said, well, we've got to get this going. We need the blessings of God. So he himself took upon the, yeah, he, he took upon the duty of, which was not his, to offer sacrifices. And then right after that, he says in there in 1 Samuel that the, and as soon as he did that, guess who shows up? <laughs> Samuel. But Samuel obviously was not pleased, and he said in 1 Samuel 13, 14, you don't need to go there, but if it's on the board, that's fine. He said, the rebuking Saul, he said, the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. A man after his own heart, man. We can put women in there, too, I think. You know, it's just for all of us. We need more of that in the church today. Men and women who seeking after the Lord's own heart. Wouldn't you like to have that said about you? Ah, my servant, Joe or somebody. He's a man after my own heart. That'd be great. Or he's a, she's a woman after my own heart. That's great. David loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. That was actually said before he was even uh, anointed. Because he, after he says, for him, the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. In other words, you're rejected because, well, you might say in the context, why? Because you, saw are not, what? Well, no, no, I use the same words there. <laughs> Let's see, the Lord saw, saw the Lord, Samuel saying this, has sought out a man after his own heart. Because you, Saul, are not, what? Yeah, you're not a man who seeks after the Lord's own heart. You do things on your own. You make your own decisions. And even later on, the same thing when he did not take care of all of the Amalekites. But anyway, in that chapter there, he, Samuel continued, and he said, And the Lord has anointed him as ruler over his people. Well, no one knew, even Samuel at that time, who David was. But that was obviously a, prop, a prophecy coming from the Lord himself. Then later on, a cap, couple chapters later, in 1 Samuel 16, then the Lord, you can read that, 1 16, 7, 1 Samuel 16, 7, and then Samuel goes down to Bethlehem in verse 6. I'll start there, 1 Samuel 16, 6. And when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. See, that's, a, that's Samuel thinking that. Aha, man, this is easy. Come right in there. And, oh, there's a guy. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance. So he, in other words, he must have been very impressed by the appearance of Eliab. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I just realized something. I wonder if that is actually Samuel saying that to uh, his, his cohort that was with him. Maybe, maybe not. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse made Shema 
pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. So the father, Jesse, obviously was probably bringing in, you know, what he thought was the best one. Obviously, Eliab at first, and then another one, and then another one. Look at all his sons pass before him. He thought, surely one of these guys would. So he probably was feeling a little bit, you know. <laughs> but Samuel this says, isn't there, isn't there another one? Samuel said in verse 11, are these all the children? And he said, the, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him here, for we will not sit down until he comes. So, verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. He was beautiful. I think ruddy means more like a, a reddish appearance, perhaps. And you, know, you see sometimes the red-haired young guys, and they're kind of like a, a wire, and they're, I think that's what it might mean, ruddy, with a beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise anoint him for this is he this is he so at least seven sons of jesse were bypassed but there was one whose his whole self was after the lord's own heart so that that that, that, says, that was a good start you might say to to king david and after that i mean it all went well with david because he loved the lord right and he even went out in battles with Saul and then it came back and remember what happened between Saul and David, a great deal of jealousy on the part of Saul because he heard the people saying what? <laughs> yeah, David has slain his 10,000 and Saul has slain his thousand. <laughs> oh, Can you imagine being a king and you kind of right hand young man was getting more praise from the people? Jealousy is a powerful thing, a very powerful thing. So David was flourishing, though. You know, he, he was acquired even more wives, even Saul's uh, daughter as a wife, and, got, and then he got Abigail as a wife, and somebody else from the northern part there as well. So his family was growing. But then something happened to David. See, something happened. So we're trying to avoid now. We're, you know what happened. We're trying to avoid that. And it's a, it's a refreshing thing to do this. And this is one reason why we're doing it, is so we, we're reminded. We're reminded. You could be walking real well with the Lord, but slowly but surely, you can drift. You can drift. And a huge calamity will be on the horizon. See, but something happened to David. So, even says there in Second Samuel 11, said, in the time of the springs, when what? Kings go out to war. Now, why spring? Well, because during the wintertime, it's wet and muddy, and all your chariots and your men are going to be bitter, and you won't be able to fight well. So you wait till the spring time. Spring time. So, but David, he was, but David was not there. He was not out to war. There's a red flag right there. A red flag. He's not out to war, but he's up on his roof. Now, this, these are roofs that are flat. Like when we lived in, uh, in the Middle East, in J Jordan, Amman, Jordan, our, the roof was flat. Or even when I lived in Morocco, too, North Africa, flat roofs. Not just flat roofs, but then they would always, usually have a little wall about three or four feet high. And especially the women would be up there. It's really not a man's place to be up on the roof. The women would uh, ha hang a line and do their laundry and dry it out. When it's a really hot day, you know, it's closing dry quickly, so they would... Uh, we would always see them shaking their, their, their wet clothes when they're on the line. Well, that was to give them, make certain that they wouldn't come out like hard as cardboard. But, but they're up doing that. They're also, uh, you know, they harvest the, uh, the rice or the, the wheat, and they bring them up in bags, and then they have a pan there. And right before them, they go through it, they take out the rocks that might be in there. And it's another way then also they, they kind of socialize up there during the evening time. You know, it's, it's primarily a woman's place even though now and then I'd go up there, but for different reasons. <laughs> but David, see, he should have been out there in the war. That guy was a great warrior. He should have been out there with his spear, with his horse or whatever, that charging, leading the charge, or even because the, they didn't want him killed, well, at least he'd be back there and shouting commands and all that. But no, he was a fighter. He should have been out there fighting. 
But he's up there now on the roof. And I don't think it's by accident, you know, he's up there. I'm just going to you know, look out over the city and see what I see. No, he probably knew there was a beautiful young lady not too far from where he lived and that he could probably get a good view because he knew that she probably would be bathing. Perhaps that's something the women did and probably they had no fear of it because no men would be up on the roof. Well, the king takes advantage of that. Sees her and you know the story, he calls for her and she comes and David has relations with her, and then she becomes pregnant. And she tells him, I'm pregnant. So David just compounds the air, and he calls for uh, Uriah, her husband, to come home from the battle, which is a crossover in the, let's say, in the country of Jordan. He said, come back over across the river, and uh, come to, so he just sets him down and say, hey, how's, how's, the, how's the war been going? You know, how's the, How's the war been going? It is so, it is so strange. Like in verse 6 of chapter 11, it says there, Then David said to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and all the people of the state of war. See, that's just a bunch of baloney there. He has a plan. He has a devious plan. Obviously, come on home. Just tell me what's going on. Give me a report. Then David said to him, verse 8, go down to your house and wash your feet. No, that doesn't, you know, what? Wash your feet and go inside. Enjoy your wife. Take a break from the war. And Uriah went out from the king's house, and a present from the king was sent out after him. Man, he just kind of wonder what that present is. You know, it's probably a bottle of wine or something like that. Verse 9, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Like, what are you doing? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and the Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. What a man. What a man. He's, he's a man of integrity. He's a righteous man. David might have said that years ago. See, but something's happening in David's life. The, the, the spirit of the Lord was such, such, on, such on David's heart and in life that everything that David did, he prospered, but not here. So then David said, okay, well, that, that didn't work out too good. Well, I haven't come over again. Stay here today, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David called him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. <laughs> okay. In other words, this integrity of Uriah, I just got to break it down somehow. Well, of course, I'll make him drunk. Anyone have any, any concept of what is right and wrong? Why, why is he worrying about those guys sleeping out, out in the open field there and over there in, near Amman, Jordan? So he made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his Lord's servant, but he did not go down to his house. What a bummer. See, David now, he's just going, oh, man. Tried once, tried twice. This guy is just, his integrity is just impeccable. I'm, no way I'm going to be able to, to get him to go down there. So he gave up on that. But he had another plan. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fight, fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. That's exactly what happened. Now, how would you like it? A righteous man, and you're giving him a letter to take to give to the commander of the army, saying, hey, place Uriah, the guy who's giving you the letter, in the front line so that he, he's going to get killed and died. See? See, Uriah, he's a righteous man. He it's, it obviously probably was sealed, and he's not going to open it. Carrying your own death sentence. This is hugely, hugely, 
hugely, obviously shameful in the life of David. What happened? God just chose him. I, I want that man. This is he, because he, his heart is totally after my heart. Well, that's not the end of the story there. What happened then? The baby was born. The end of chapter 11. It says there in 27, of verse 26, after Uriah was killed, now the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. So whatever happened, David had started to wander away from the Lord, and wander away from his Lord, wandering away from worshiping the Lord, and therefore you forget about who God is exactly. One thing I think about God, he doesn't miss anything that happens in life. What David did was in the sight of the Lord. David, for some reason, now maybe you and you've done some really some stupid thing. That's, that's also what precedes that is, well, or maybe you don't even think about it, right? I'll maybe include myself. <laughs> maybe we don't even think about it at that time, doing something so stupid. Don't think that the Lord's everywhere. That's why we are so important to learn about who God is, because he's everywhere omniscient, omnipresent. I mean, he knows all. He sees all. He's everywhere. The problem there in Isaiah 40, the great chapter of, of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, we're not going to go there, but uh, at the end of it, well, the Lord talks about his great, now who, who, who's going to be my counselor to counsel me? You know, who, who has set the, the, the stars and the heavens above? Or who, who are the nations? They're like a what? A drop from the bucket. You know, they were the worthless in all their power and strength. You go, why? Why is he even saying that? Then he says, so why do you say, O Israel, contend, O Judah, that the, the, the justice due me escapes the knowledge of the Lord? Or he has passed by it. And the Lord just say, no. <laughs> just because I haven't acted in the way you think I should have acted doesn't mean I'm not there and don't see what's going on. So they're, they're over there saying, well, ju justice, oh, you know, the Lord. And I like that hymn, you know, where you say, uh, do not pass me by. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Well, you don't even have to sing that, I mean, because he'll never pass you by. Never. Never. It's everywhere. All seven and a half billion people on earth are praying to him at one time. Guess what? He can hear it all and understand it all. It's not like, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, it, no. just, can I just, I'm just attending to the Chinese people right now. I'll get to the... No, no, no. But same with when we do things wrong, see? He sees. He sees. That's one of the first things people forget when suddenly there's maybe a strong walker. He thought he was a strong walker. She was a strong And all of a sudden, wow, how did that happen? Or why did I do that, God? One of the first things you're reminded, the Lord rebukes you, is, Lord, I did that. I did that in your sight, didn't I? Yep. So anyway, the Lord uh, had not given up on David, thankfully. A little bit of time went on after the birth of the child, and then Nathan the prophet uh, gives David a, a visit. And you know the story about that. And he goes, David, I got a little, I want to relate to you something. There was a rich man who had all sorts of sheep and cattle and everything like that. And there was a poor man in town, and he only had one little ewe. And that little ewe was, they fed it, they drank from their tables. It's like, like the per. That little you was part of the family, you know, he even sitting at the table. Anyway, where the, they just nurtured it, and the, the kids played with it, and it just like became like one of his daughters. Well, then the rich man had somebody visiting a wayfarer and came to him, and the, the rich man didn't want to use up one of his 
sheep, so he went over and took the the sheep of that one, that one ewe of the poor man, and slaughtered it and gave it to his guest. David was incensed. David was incensed, verse 5 of chapter 12. And David's anger burned against this, this man, against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the one who has done this deserves to die. <laughs> An animal, okay? David, <laughs> he's just going to get a little perspective on life here that Nathan said to, oh, he, he said in verse 6, he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. <laughs> Probably one of the greatest scenes in all the Bible, Nathan then said to David, you, you are the man. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul, and I also gave you your master's house and your master's wife into your care, and I also gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you more things like these. See? What were you lacking, David? Gee. Verse 9, and look at, you know, we get some insight. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil? In his sight. Aha. Uh -huh. See, the word of the Lord. See, that's one of the first things you stop doing. You stop reading your Bible. You stop coming to meetings or fellowship you know, with other Christians. You stop listening to the word of God. And then by that time, well, as time passes on, then all of a sudden the, the world's view of God, you, you're incorporating that into your mind. So why have you despised the word of God by doing this evil thing? And, then he says also in verse 9, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And as you know, then the Lord took the life of the, that young baby, newborn baby, and then, then, uh, then also a number of his sons as well. I think four sons of his died. Kind of what David pronounced, he's got to pay fourfold. David paid fourfold. So during, after that then, what we see then is in the book of Psalms, there are two Psalms that are written really covering this part of David's life. Not the before the, the rebuke by Nathan, but most likely directly after, that's Psalm 51. And then a little bit later would be Psalm 32. And I'm going to read some aspects of 50, Psalm 51 real quick, then get into Psalm 32. 51 says this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. See, this is David saying that. Be gracious to me. Why? Because, according to your loving kindness, because your mercy. Because why? I need it. I need it. You're, with, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from the iniquity and cleanse my sins. He's saying, don't keep on the record what I have done. See, this, this is... Now he, this is a time where the hand of God is on him strongly, and he, he realizes fully now what he has done. He's, and he's back to mending his, his life now, mending his walk with the Lord, mending his heart, so it's fully going after the Lord. To take away my transgressions. See, wash me. Why does he say wash me? Because he feels what? Filthy and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. He says, more, this is what I did, I did, I know it. Then he even goes down there in verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. Yeah, David, did you seek, speak some lies during that episode? Yeah. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with this. Why? Because I'm filthy and dirty. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Why? Because he has... <laughs> He hasn't had a day of joy and gladness for a long period of time. You know it. If you got, had a period of time where you, the hand of the Lord was on you, I've had that. Believe me, brethren, it is not fun. You don't go around, <laughs> joyful. Yeah, be joyful. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm trying to be joyful, but. Create in me a clean heart. Or oh, even that before that. Yeah, we say, make ye, me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken <laughs> rejoice and amend me, Lord. Hide your face from my sins. Look, I'm so ashamed. Don't even look at it anymore, God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me away from your presence. 
See, it's a fear that God isn't going to be close to him. Believe me, when you do something really stupid, that's one thing you feel like. Where are you, God? Who are you? Do not take your Holy Spirit from you from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. So that's when he's going through being spanked, you might say, by God. Let's go back to Psalm 32 now. And this is after there's been some healing. His heart's been restored. It's, uh, he's happy again. And so there's hope. In other words, as we read about in, in Hebrews, you know, the Lord loves his children so much that he does what to them? When they sin, he disciplines them. That's a sign that he loves you. So we aren't to pull out of, you know, the, the discipline of the Lord. We're supposed to bear with it. But in time, the Lord, what? He lifts it up. He lifts it up. David starts there in Psalm 32. The first part is, you might say this, uh, he's happy. He's happy. Verses 1 to 2, how blessed or how happy is he whose transgression is forgiven? Oh, yeah. Whose sin is covered. See, in 51, he was asked, for God, God blotted out, forgive me. Don't even look at it. But now he realizes and he's restored. goes, oh, how happy. And he's, he's, he's emotional now. He's expressing his joy. Oh, how blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. In other words, it's all forgiven. The transgressions, the sin, the iniquity, three descriptions of it. And in whose spirit there is no seed. How blessed is that? So it's like, a, it's like a, you might say he's calling out to people, and this is a psalm that would have been a son for people, calling out to them, and this is like a, the hook. Who wants to be happy out there? Well, the one whose sins are forgiven will be happy. Verse 3, when I kept silent. Now he's got a little testimony here. He, he was, I'm happy now, but I, I was sad. And this is it. Verses 3 and 4, when I kept silent about my sin. Ooh, did he keep silent about his sin? You bet. At least nine months, because it wasn't until after the baby was born that he finally confess, and that was when the help of the prophet Nathan. But when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. It's one of the first things we do. Sometimes you're so ashamed about it, you don't even want to confess it to God. Or maybe if you've done something wrong to somebody else, and you should go confess it to them, you don't do that either. And those two really are necessary. If you sin against somebody, you, you should go to them and ask forgiveness. If that person's a righteous person, they will what? Forgive you, you bet. But when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. See, he's not happy here. And physically, the body can be worn down. You bet it can. The mind, even probably even the muscle strength. Through my groaning all day long, the word there is actually roaring. Oh. So he was quiet about it, thinking, well, maybe the Lord forgot about it, or maybe he's not going to do anything about it. Oh, but his body, his mind, his conscience hasn't forgot about it. That's good. He still has a, a sensitive conscience. Roaring all day long. Oh, I, you, you ever done that? Wake up in the middle of the night, and you just go, why? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? You could bring up something from decades ago. I have. <laughs> For day, in verse 4, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. See, he's always talking past tense, but it, it's, so he, this is his testimony then, how it was. Oh, your hand was heavy upon me, and for good, for good. Because the Lord is using that hand to press him to a point of not being quiet about his sin, but to confess it. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away with the fever heat of summer. Whoa. Boy, his body. So in other words, he lived like every day, even if it was winter, his vitality was shot. Lalo saw me the other day. Both Dan and I were working, and we got working a little bit later. And he said, boy, you really look wiped out the other day. And I said, I was. My boss was in town, and he was cracking the whip. Dan shaking his head. I was dead. 
But imagine being that, even with the, not doing physical, something physical there, your vitality is drained away. With, and I remember those football practices, two a days, I spoke about them last time on Tuesday night, but boy, boy, those were killers. Two practices a day, and I just remember running, doing sprints at the end, the cotton now, the, no moisture in your throat. And this is how he feels. Aha, so he was happy in one and two, three and four. He was sad or he was burdened. The hand of the Lord was on him. But verse five, there's a change here. This is what he did. Therefore, I acknowledge my sin to you. So now he's speaking to God. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. See, there it is. Finally, he woke up and realized, you know, the God I know is a forgiving God. He's a forgiving God. If we confess our sins, what? God is what? Faithful and just to what? Forgive, Forgive us the sins. That's why it's so, no, it's so important to know theology about who God is. Not just in the Bible, but then to experience it when it happens. So he finally came to his senses and he confessed. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. Finally, well, he had some help there but with Nathan. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Then it says Selah there, by the way. Selah is also after verse 4. That means basically take a, take a rest. You know, when you sing it, just even pause for a moment. Let, let that truth that just was spoken sink in there. For example, at the end of verse 4, my vitality was drained away as with the heat of the summer. Take a break and think about that. Even while singing it, a little pause. That's right. In other words, this is the result of sin. Then I acknowledged my sin. I did not hide anything. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Pause. How wonderful is that? Therefore, verse 6, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. So in other words, he had this great experience, and now he's sharing it with everybody. <laughs> let everyone. Basically, he's now back to being an evangelist. Even in Psalm 51, he, he talked about him healing him. He goes, and then I will, I will convert sinners back to your way. Now he's calling out. because He's been healed. He's been restored. And that should be the plight, or that should be the joy of every Christian, not to give you a testimony, but then also tell people about that. Like I've said before, when I became a Christian in Sweden, I was with a group uh, 40 of us from California went there, but five of us were separated and we were studying freshwater ecology when there's two Swedish girls, so there's seven of us in this little cohort. And uh, I became a Christian during this time. And uh, I wasn't really preaching much, at least. Uh, but they saw, they saw this huge change in me. One day I was out in the parking lot and Annette Viklund, I remember her name, riding up on a bike and she, uh, no, she came up to me, that was later. She came up to me uh, and said, I just want to have what you have. She saw, she saw me, what I was like before, what it's like after Christ. See, now if I had no testimony or anything like that, I said, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? No, no I want her to know the forgiveness of God. At that time, I was so, <laughs> I don't even really know what I did, except, but uh, to become a Christian, well, I mean, I, I did, I, I read a track. Four spiritual laws, and so I had one. I said, "Here okay, are four spiritual laws in the Bible." I said, "Just read these and believe. You know, read it." And she did. And she's a girl that came back about a week later on her bike in the parking lot. That's where it was, and she got off her bike just with a grin from ear to ear. And she got off, and she just said, "Bob, reading the Bible is like drinking alcohol." <laughs> I said, I that Beaklin, I'll never forget that moment. That's what you should do. When we know that we've been forgiven, we should tell everybody. Tell everybody. Then he praises the Lord in verse 7. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. There it is. For some reason, David had gotten out of that hiding place. 
And the Lord didn't preserve him from trouble when he wanted to go his own way, and that's what happens. But, good news, you can come right back to it. Psalm 103, remember the Lord has compassion on us. He separates his sins as far, our sins as far as the east is from the west. And he's remindful of you know, all that. He forgives totally. He's remindful that we are but what? Dust. Dust. That's what we're made out of. Dust. See, he knows. He's compassionate and ready to forgive. I know your frame. You will surround me, verse 7, the latter part, with songs of deliverance. See, in other words, you will, you will deliver me, Lord. You'll hide me. You will deliver me. And I'll, I'll be singing the songs of deliverance. Even from sin. That's probably the most important part. So I will instruct you. Now the Lord takes over here. Because I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. See, now... David, he thinks that literally, it should have been like this. Okay, chapter 7 of the first, second Samuel opens up. It, now, it was in the spring, and David got on his horse and led his army into battle. <laughs> yeah. Now, why are you doing that, David? Well, because the Lord taught me and instructed me to do so. Now, the, the will of the Lord in our lives, for whatever reason, isn't that hidden. And there might be things that are weighed a bit. But this is hugely important, by the way. Because the Lord's alive. And if he's very close to you, if he's in you, I mean, how much closer? What's he doing there? One thing he's doing, he's instructing you, and he's teaching you. Also, he's even teaching through the word of God. It might be me speaking like today, but the Lord takes that and impresses it on your heart and your mind. Which way should I go? Which way should I go? Life's not a mystery. See, look at that. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The big advantage that the Lord has over any other counselor is what he knows everything, and he sees everything, and he'll tell you, do this, do that, and impress it upon you somehow. It might not be in words like that, but there will be some sort of communication. But there's a, there is a could be a uh, wrench you might say in the clog here or something clogging up the the listening by the way you should listen to the lord at night sometimes you know again i'm not trying to be mystical or anything like i hear but you know at nighttime when there's it's quiet weather and you wake up in the middle of the night sometimes that's when you can have really good sweet communion with the lord you know he's not going to say okay bob now this is what you know <laughs> But, you know, you read his word and you pray and you feel his counsel. You understand things a lot better. But, he says there, verse 9, Do not be as a horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in checks, and otherwise they will not come to you. In other words, mules are what? Stubborn as a mule, right? In other words, you want them to come this way and you pull on it and they'll, they'll go the other way. What a, what a graphic, uh, you might say, simile here. Don't be like them. Now, you shouldn't have to have a, you know, a, what do you call a, a what, what's right in here, in the mouth? Yeah, well, uh, the bit. The bit's in the mouth, right? Then the, then the whatever, the, the bridle and the whole mechanism. You, you shouldn't need that. You shouldn't need the rope there that we're pulling against it. No! From God. Go this way, son. Go this way. No, 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 no. No. Some counsel, you know, along the way that uh, we always heard when we're, going to seminary and a number of times the pastor would say three most important things in ministry gentlemen are one never be alone with another woman the second is never be alone with another woman the third is <laughs> never be alone with another woman why well that's too many pastors have fallen that way that's wise counsel and to, to resist that to resist that no you know the will of the Lord isn't that difficult. Many of the sorrows, verse 10 now, many of the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. He's giving a, he's giving a contrast there. The wicked who don't care anything about God, well, you know something? Their life is going to be filled with sorrow after sorrow after sorrow. I know somebody recently said, look, it sounds like you're, it feels like your life is cursed. Get back to the Lord. 
get back to the Lord. I mean, everything wrong is happening. It's like, get back to the Lord. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Uh, what would you rather have? There's, there's a choice there. Well, do I want sorrows? Or do I want loving kindness surrounding me? Then he's assuming that somebody will choose the latter there. Of course, trusting in the Lord. In verse 11, kind of ends where the whole psalm began. How blessed, or be happy, be glad in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy with all, all you who are upright in what? Heart. Upright in heart. Amen, brethren. And the same be towards you. I trust you're righteous. I trust you're touchy. Following the Lord, listening to his counsel, not being stubborn. And if so, well, be glad. You have great cause to be glad. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for Psalm 32, even Psalm 51, and then the life of David that we saw a short glimpse of. What a good man he was, Lord, except for that one bad incident, Lord. Lord, we could say that for our lives as well. Maybe we've lived a pretty good life, but maybe there's some things in our lives help us enough that we've done stupidly. Help us not to dwell on them, God. Why? Because you've, you've uh, forgiven us, Lord. And when you forgive things, sins in our lives, you say you, you've thrown them in the depths of the sea and you don't even remember them anymore. God, may we just rejoice in that and be surrounded by that loving kindness, that mercy. Thank you, Lord, and help us in, to rejoice too. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.